Marshall Fields Wholesale Store by John Mel Hewish for Architecture of the World. In 1886, Marshall Field and Company Wholesale, and I quote, this building covers the entire block of ground, is seven stories and basement in height, constructed of granite and brownstone, and is the finest and largest structure in this country designed for commercial use. The dimensions are 325 feet by 190 feet, or about one and a half acres. The total floor space occupied for selling goods on all floors combined is about 12 acres. We show the largest and best selected stock of dry goods in the world. Prices always are the lowest. Marshall Field was born in Massachusetts. The son of farmers, he soon got into the dry goods business and worked his way up quickly to owner and moved west to Chicago. After several man mergers and buyouts, he established Marshall Field and Company in 1881. He had both a wholesale and retail business, with the wholesale business doing five times the retail business at that time. He built his business on customer service. Fields was in the right business at the right time. In the 1860s, railroads were expanding westward, and Chicago became the most powerful commercial center in America. By the beginning of the 20th century, no fewer than 30 interstate routes fanned out from the city, and the resulting ease in reaching both raw materials and markets contributed to the city's rapid commercial and industrial development. Most important of all, Chicago was the terminus of every one of the railroads. Passengers, raw materials, and finished goods all had to be transferred between lines in the city, thus contributing to an extraordinary development of hotels, restaurants, taxi cabs, warehouses, rail yards, and trucking companies. Marshall Field and his partners had established both a wholesale and retail business in downtown Chicago. In 1871, his businesses were consumed by a fire that ravaged 3.3 square miles of the city. Those who had been attracted to Chicago by the post-fire rebuilding opportunities stayed on in the 1880s to design a new generation of even taller downtown buildings. Department stores and offices crowded into the central area, and industrial growth along the river branches and rail lines was equally phenomenal. Fields was not only a good businessman, but he was also a shrewd investor. After the fire, Marshall Field began buying lots and soon owned an entire block. He was now ready to build his store. The next step was to hire an architect. At that time, the top architect in America was Henry Hobson Richardson. Richardson was born in Louisiana and studied at Harvard and the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. After the Civil War, he settled in New York and began to develop his style. Richardson's style by that time was Romanesque and eventually became known as Richardsonian. At that point, Marshall Field was looking for an architect. His Trinity Church in Boston was voted as the most important building in the U.S. Richardson had never designed this type of building before. He took his direction from Marshall Field himself, historical examples, and contemporary designs. Richardson died in 1886 and never saw the completion of the building. It was finished by his associates. Few records survive as to what was part of Richardson's plan or Fields' direction. After acquiring his block, Fields wanted as much space devoted to his goods as possible. He had visited Italy and appreciated the stone structures. He wanted a stone facade to show that his building contained nothing cheap or flimsy. He said it should be, quote, fitted for a fort as well as commerce. At the same time, Fields did not want to spend a lot of money on the inside or on ornamentation. He wanted to keep his prices low. Given that direction, Richardson knew he would have to create, quote, beauty of material and symmetry rather than mere superficial ornamentation. Richardson had visited Italy in the 1870s, and the Palazzo Medici is definitely a source of inspiration. Other sources were closer to home. Several large box-style stone buildings were going up at that time. One example is the New York Pro Produce Exchange. This was architect George Post's take on Italian Renaissance. The building was red brick and trimmed in terracotta. The tripartite design of the main structure featured rows of arched openings. Richardson brought plans with him in 1885 to Chicago. 
He had originally wanted a central atrium, but Fields wanted as much space devoted to his merchandise as possible. So they settled on this U-shaped design. Fire protection was very important. The store was laid out in three main vertical sections separated by firewalls. Firewalls divide the building to halt the spread of a fire. Hollow clay tile were used between the ceilings and floor. Also, roll-away iron shutters were used on all windows. Any wood used was the slow-burning type. The center room contained a pair of freestanding passenger elevators and the main stair on the main axis near the wall of the court. Freight elevators, smokestacks, and lavatories were strung out along the back wall. The store was a cage construction, which meant there was a skeletal inferior of steel beams braced and enclosed by load-bearing walls on the exterior. They were seven floors to showcase the goods. The interior varied by floor. The basement through the third floor had fireproofed terracotta columns with Romanesque capitals. Floors four through seven had columns of wood iron castings. The glass covered loading dock was located in the U of the building. It opened to the freight elevators and made for easy access to transportation. The building contains brick load bearing walls with a stone veneer. According to Richardson, his goal in designing the stone work was, quote, a unified horizontal block finely balanced in the articulation of solid and voids glowing ruddily against the darker and fussier urban matrix. Two types of materials were used, red granite for the basement and ground floors and red sandstone for the top floors. For the design, the basement is segmentally arched. Above that is a progression of stacked arcades that follow a 1-2-4 pattern for the arcades and a 3-2-1 pattern for the floors per arch. This shows Richardson's use of classic principles. At the top is a Gothic style cornice. Here you can see how big the stones were. The stones and granite were longer than those utilized by any other building in the city. The windows were recessed to the inner face to emphasize the thickness of the stone. The cornice is crocketed in the Gothic style. It was described as, quote, vigorously and crudely cut to be in scale with the whole mass it terminates. The result was one of a kind. General store owners from across the Midwest would arrive at Marshall Field's wholesale store and wander through 500,000 square feet of merchandise accompanied by a field employee. Baby carriages, musical instruments, sports equipment, furniture, medical instruments, anything anyone could hope to want was available, neatly presented at the wholesale store. In 1936, the Museum of Modern Art in New York had an exhibit honoring Richardson. Here it was said, the field store is Richardson's most important building. Richardson shows in the field store that commercial architecture might have its own honest distinction, independent both of the past and of other contemporary types of design. There were other box style buildings going up in Chicago's business district at that time. As Chicago architects struggled with puzzling together steel framed building in the 1880s, curbside facades of these very early skyscrapers took on traditional known forms. The 12th story, a 180 feet face of the Rookery building created an impression of traditional form in 1888. Others influenced by Richardson's work include Lewis Sullivan and Dankmar Adler, who would later be part of the Chicago School of Architecture. This is a picture of their standard club of 1889. Another building by Sullivan and Adler is the Auditorium building, which continues the simple tradition of style. The Marshalls Fields Wholesale Store was demolished 43 years after it was built. By the 1920s, the division was in trouble due to competition, and in 1927, it moved to the Merchandise Mart. Though it was only around for a short period of time, its legacy lives on. Thank you very much.